on the road one day, and this young man by the name of Dennis Reed uh, happened to come in the room and get on the piano. And I told him then, I said, let's go on Facebook Live because I feel like somebody needs to hear this message right here. He wrote this song, you guys. It goes like this. You've been through some things in this room. Are you going through some things right now? You ought to just lift up your hands right now. Can we say that again? Can we say it again? Like no one else. Necessary. It was necessary. See, it's hard to believe that when you're going through it. You it was but it's necessary. necessary. If you just hang on in there. If you just hang on in there. It it's necessary. necessary. It's necessary. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. It, it was, was necessary. Hallelujah. 
that God could do what he was going to do in our lives. That was no, uh, none of our own music. That was the music by Fantasia and Necessary. So uh, thank you all for joining today with Monumental Moments in God's Word. And we are going to be talking today and giving you a word today that is going to benefit. I pray that it will benefit um, you all out there. It will benefit us in our daily walk with the Lord. Praise the Lord. So before we, um, I just wanted to play that song necessary because it is necessary. We're going to be talking today about traps. Traps. We're going to be talking about how we fall, how we fail, and how we recover. How we recover. So just watch your step in everything that you do. So we have looked at variety of traps that Satan places in our path. In different teachings that I've taught on monumental moments in God's word down through the four years that I've been doing, close to five years now, that I've been doing this show. And we've seen these traps come in different sizes. They come large, small, they come uh, subtle, they come blatant. And all the traps that we look at there are some of us out there who thought that a particular trap, that a particular temptation was not something that you had to deal with, but by yourself maybe. But we understand that God is always with us. And Satan has a way of personalizing these traps for us. So I'm going to start out with just a word of prayer, first of all. So please, please, let's allow the Spirit of the Lord to enter in. Enter in. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I come before you right now, Lord God. First of all, I want to just say thank you, thank you, thank you for your ever-loving grace, your ever-loving mercy, your ability to be all things to all people everything to all people, even when we don't recognize it, that the very air that we breathe, the very heart that our, our heart beats, the very breath that we breathe into our nostrils is all for you. And so, Father, we give you praise and honor and thank you for the great, the, your blessed, uh, precious, precious gift that you have given us by sparing us another day to be on the Lord's journey. So, Father, right now, I just ask, Lord God, that you continue to bless us and keep us, Lord. Father God, let your face shine upon us, Lord God. Let the words that come out, Lord God, be beneficial for the people that are listening, Lord God. Let them understand that what is being, tra uh, being taught, Lord God, today, that someone will get a, hear a word from you, Lord. Receive your word. And change their lives. Lord God, that someone will want to come and say, what must I do to be saved? Father God, give them the ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Lord, we bless your name and we give you honor, glory, and praise forevermore. Lord, now, Lord God, I ask that you gird my mouth, Lord God. Father God, allow me to speak only what you would have me to speak. Allow me to decrease while you increase in me, Lord God. Father, that you will always get the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Anyone that is joining us on today, I thank you. This is Monumental Moments in God's Word. Thank you, Pranitha, for joining. Hallelujah. Uh, I, I have not been on here doing Monumental Moments in a little while. I don't do it every week. Uh, like I used to, um, because people get, I think they get, um, uh, for lack of better words, they don't want to sit and listen to a message, really. 
And just like people falling away from the church and not going to wanting to go to church and listen to a message, they don't want to listen online all the time either. But I'm just going to give what God has given us today and keep it moving. How are you doing? I'm glad you were with me and the other people that are have joined. I thank God for you. Um, so we're gonna get right on into the word. We're talking about um, we're talking about failure, fall, falling failure, and recovering from the sins of this world. And so I looked at the word trap, the trap of bitterness. Okay. The trap of bitterness will keep us from being able to do everything that we need to do for the Lord. It causes us to not be able to do the things that God has called us to do when we're trapped in bitterness. Bitterness is one of those things that will cause us to fall, will cause us to fail. Hallelujah. So everyone has a tendency to grow bitter with some of the life difficulties that come our way. Bitterness is like a cancer that deteriorates the mind and the heart of the people. And if you don't check it, and it goes on and on and on, and no, no nothing has rebuked, you, you haven't rebuked the enemy in your mind and in your heart, this tendency can eventually poison a person's perspective towards just about everything that they want to do. When you let the root of bitterness grow, everyone has a tendency to grow bitter, as I said, with all the difficulties that you have in your life. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. That's in the book of Hebrews 12 and 15. Each individual has the power of choice to possess an attitude of bitterness or optimism. You can choose one or the other. You can have bitterness or you can be optimistic. Let's just look at just a few things that causes it. If you want to avoid the, bitter, the bitterness trap, which is the trap of the enemy, and replace your complaining with friend, complaining to friends with positive thoughts, positive talk. We all tend to become like the people we associate with. So, you know that old saying about you become who you are around. You know, uh, bad company corrupts good morals. If you try to avoid complaining, then you can't hang around a complaining person. And we all tend to become just like the people that we decide to hang around with, okay? You may not think that you do, but you can come become more and more like that. And Solomon, he wrote once, uh, he who walks, uh, he who walks with wise men will be wise. But the companion of fools will suffer, will suffer harm. So if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, replace your attitude. <laughs> replace your attitude of scorning with one of thankfulness to God, our creator. And Paul wrote, do everything without complaining or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a crooked and depraved generation in which you shine like stars in the universe. That's in Philippians 2 to 13. And if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, you need to start becoming working. You need to work. Engage in the ministry of the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus. Paul writes, hold out the word of life in order that I may boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor for nothing. So when we give our tracks out to people, 
And we speak of Jesus means what Jesus means to, to me or to us and offer uh, comfort to people. And we give them passages of hope to people that we associate with. The Lord fills our hearts with joy. We, that's when we say the joy of the Lord is my strength. You have joy when you talk about the Lord to people. If you want to avoid the bitterness trap, replace any bad attitude that's in your heart with kindness and compassion and forgiveness. Forgiving everyone as Christ, God forgave you. That's in Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. We have the power to choose to be kind and caring and forgiving since Jesus set that supreme example. He's the one that gave us that example. And if you want to avoid the bitterness trap and negative conversation, Paul, he writes in, the, in his book, put off our old self, which is being corrupted of its deceitful desires. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. Oh, Lord, hit us where it hurts. Hit us, Lord. But only what is helpful for the building others up according to their needs according to their needs. When we learn to speak, when we learn to speak, um, hold on, someone is at my door and I don't know who it is. Uh, hold on, I'm going to have to pause for a minute. Mark! Yes, hold on. He's at the door. My dog's got out. Hold on, people. Hold on. Get, get it out here where we can. My dog's got out. They dug a hole up under the fence. So that was a neighbor. And he's bringing the other one. I'm keeping my daughter's dog. So y'all forgive me. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm so, so sorry. Ah, oh, Lord Jesus. Um, so... He's getting ready to come back, so I'm going to have to leave for one more second. Y'all stay with me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Thank you, Pranitha. Hold on a second. I'll be right back. Hold on a second. may have to do a whole nother thing. Please forgive me, Pranitha, and whoever else joined me. I'll, please forgive me. Um, my daughter's going to be getting. So um, we're talking about according to our. So if you want to avoid bitterness and trap, we have to end negative conversations. We have to um, put on wholesome talk. Don't talk unwholesome talk. Don't let that come out of your mouth but only what is helpful for the building up according to their needs. We have to know what a person needs and build them up with the spirit of the Lord so that they will be stronger, so that they will understand what they need. Um, when we learn to speak in an edifying way, it fills our hearts with gladness. We feel good about when we edify God and we edify his word to other people. And building others up has a way of lifting our own self-worth. We feel better about ourselves when we are lifting other people up to make them feel better. So if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, do not become a mind slave to negative television, newspapers. We don't hardly read newspapers, radios, magazines, all that other stuff, podcasts, whatever. Don't just fill your mind with negative stuff all the time. The world is filled with bad news in the media all the time. All the time because it gets ratings people look at it because it gets ratings 
but instead we're to fix our thoughts on what is true and good and right and perfect. Think about the good things in others. Praise God for all of his goodness. Be glad for every single moment. And if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, commit yourself to fulfilling God's priorities of worship, church growth, evangelism, and discipline, making making John make uh, discipline making John what John once said uh, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth that's in 3 John 3 John 1 through 5 hold on one second I think my note is coming back to my door hold on hold on let me go see real quick. Okay. Let me say. Now the dog don't want to come in, come in that into the cage where we have. Okay, so uh, into his uh, carriage. Um, but anyway. I'm sorry for the interruptions, Lord Jesus. Um, so, if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, though, you have to commit yourselves to the fulfilling God's priorities of worship, church growth, evangelism, discipline. Um, and we're, and, and, the, and John says, Lord help me. And John says, I have no greater joy than to than that. That's what he's saying. He had no greater joy than that. And if you want to avoid the bitterness trap, watch your tongue. Watch your tongue. James writes in his book, out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers. And he said, this should not be. We should not praise God with one with our tongue and then turn around and curse him at the same time. That's in James 3 and 10. Uh, we got to program our thoughts to speak of the great things God is doing for us. We can't continue to always murmur and complain. We got to be able to fix our minds on the goodness of Jesus and what he's done for us and how he's blessed us. So if you got to program your thoughts to speaking the goodness of Jesus and the goodness of God, and the goodness of the Holy Spirit, which is one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If we speak of the great things that God is doing in our lives, that he's done in our lives, that he continues to do in our lives, then people will see that. People will see that. They will, they will see that you are speaking the goodness of Jesus. If you want to avoid the bitterness trap again, stop fighting and, and arguing with each other. What causes fights and, and arguments among you? Don't they come from the desires that you battle within your own heart? That's what they come from. That's why we argue and fight, because of stuff that we battle within our own hearts. And, 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 and a lot of times it's because we want something, and because we want it, we can't get it. So we get angry. We get frustrated and we start arguing, bickering, acting crazy about it. What causes those fights among you? They come from what I just said about battle, the battle within you. But you want something you don't get. You kill, you destroy, you covet, but you can't have what you want. So you argue and you fight over it. The worst enemy you have is within your own sinful nature. That is the true statement. It's really not about that other person. It's about what's in your heart. If you want to avoid bitterness, that bitterness trap, stop slandering one another. Stop defaming each other. Stop talking about each other. Stop being hurtful and nasty towards one another. James writes, brothers, do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. That's the word. 
That's what the word tells us. There is un, there is only one lawful, there's only one lawgiver and judge. The one who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you judge who are you to judge your neighbor? James 4, 11 and 12. Leave the judgments to God. So another one of the traps we are look we go uh, we gonna look at it's found in Psalms fifty nine and twelve for the sin of their mouths the words of their lips let them let them be trapped in their pride so Proverbs sixteen and eighteen says pride goes before destruction and a haughty and a haughtiness before a fall. And when you think about that, how pride is the reason for a lot of destruction. It is. Um, and we have to think about what we, we have to think about that. Um, and what I think about in my mind is someone casually walking along and they so absorbed in themselves. And they about to fall into a trap that they never saw coming because they were so involved in their own thoughts of themselves. And that's how I view America today, sir. We, 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 we thinking so much about ourselves and how much money we can make that we're falling we don't even see the big hole that's in front of us because we're thinking about, we've got our minds fixated on how we can do better financially, how we can do better than the next person and all that kind of stuff. I was, I think uh, I was traveling. I think, I think I may have been in Georgia visiting one time and um and I saw a sign that said, America is the only country in the world that was created for a good purpose. I think I saw that. No, it wasn't. It was up in Maryland. That's right. And it was on outside of a church. And that church was trying to be so patriotic. But I realized a couple of things about that statement. That statement is full of pride and is simply not true really not true it, it really isn't if you think about it it's not the bible tells us that god created the earth and that it was good and everything in it was good and as americans we often fall into this trap of thinking that we are the only country in the world that god is blessing and that we are the only country in the world that are doing anything right and I'm patriotic. I love my country. We do love this country. I've served the country. My husband served the country. My ex two husbands served the country. But David is serving a special ops team right now. Uh, on, on in the Word of God, right? He's basically on a special ops team. If y'all know what that is, in the military. Um. And even though, like, even going to Iraq and my husband going to Afghanistan and Iraq and stuff like that, right? I do believe that the Afghanistanian people were created for a good purpose as well. I also believe that Iraq, with all the problems that they had, were created for a good purpose as well. I believe that every country in our world was created for a good purpose. But as evil has overflourished us, I guess I, if, that, if that's a word at all, these countries have become a place where mankind got our beginning. We believe that, um, that it was the birthplace 
of Adam and Eve when we talk about Afghanistan, uh, Iraq area and all that stuff, right? Garden of, Eden, Garden of Eden's over in that area. Um, the uh, so, so it would be hard to say that Iraq was not created for a good purpose, right? When we know, according to the Bible, where Garden of Eden, the Garden of Eden was actually at, and there are many countries around the world that have fallen, and I believe in most cases it's due to power struggles. Who wants to be the most powerful? Who wants to have the most money? Who wants to be able to lead and guide their people the most and the best? And with those struggle, struggles that takes place, it it's basically based on pride. Solomon said pride comes before a fall, and I believe that is exactly what is happening in the United States and what's happening in a whole lot of other countries. So first of all, we should be aware that pride can be a very good thing as well. If we take pride in our families, not, not, not haughty arrogance, but pride in our families, if we take pride in our country and treat it right, it means that we pour more of ourselves into these things. We pour more of ourselves into our families. We pour more of ourselves into the friends. We pour more of ourselves into our, 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 our co-workers and, and our communities. So we're taking pride in that. So that's a good thing. It usually means we have worked hard and that we have invested time and energy and our money in something that we are pleased with the results. So we are proud of them, godly proud of them. But Paul expresses this in speaking to the church of Corinth, right? I have said before you that you have such a place in our hearts that we would live or die for you. I have great confidence in you. I take great pride in you. That's what Paul says to the Corinthian church. And I am greatly encouraged in 2 Corinthians 7 and 4. Okay? So Paul took pride in those who were in the church who helped start. And in the people because of their spiritual growth. He took pride in that. Paul made an investment in these people. And he was proud of their results, of the results. It's just like where you have served in a church for years and years and years. And maybe you left that church and now you see your pastor and you're able to look back on where God has brought you from. And for being able to be uh, uh, invested in that community and loving that, uh, loving the, the foundation of your growth and all those types of things. And then your pastor can look and say, wow, I'm so proud. I'm godly proud of the people that was that served up in the ministry and are doing well I'm proud of them now that's a good thing I'm proud of them now they're doing well I see their personal spiritual growth and that does my heart good it's good to have pride in Jesus and what he does in the lives of his people and if you are a part of that then be proud. It's okay to be proud. Now, we also should be aware that pride can be very sinful. It can also be a very sinful thing. So sometimes you have that same type of situation and that person is not proud because they, you didn't do it under them or they feel like that, that because you're no longer with them, they don't wish good things for you. They're, they're upset because of your growth because they don't see they don't see that the teachings and the things that they poured into you was what made you that way. They think it's somebody else that's getting the that's getting the glory out of that or they're getting the they're getting that out of boy out of boy. but that's not what it's about. It's about the upbuilding of the kingdom. It's about soul winning. it's about spiritual growth. For the Lord, the love for the Lord. And you should be proud. Any pastor that can see that 
he started a person out young in their young in their youthful young adult life and they're grown up and they become a better person and they're living for the Lord and they're they're preaching and they're teaching God's word and things ought to be proud of the growth the spiritual growth in that person that they even had a a a a uh, a place where they were the ones that was built helping build that foundation in that person now we also we got to be aware of that that uh, many times it is all wrapped up in the little word I. We have to stop taking ownership of what everybody's success is and thinking that they are it's all about them. It is a good thing to be proud of how God is working in someone else's life. And it's good to be godly proud of how Christ is making a uh, making a difference in someone else's life. But we get into a problem when there is too much emphasis placed on self. Well, you know, if it wasn't for me, they wouldn't be doing what they're doing. Uh, if it wasn't for me and the teaching that I gave them. We got to be careful for all that. In the Gospel of Luke uh, 10 and 18, Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, what is it that causes us to fall? Well, let's talk about that now. Pride. Pride is what causes people to fall. You should be proud. We believe the re that the reason for Satan's fall is found in Isaiah 14, 12, and 12 through 14. Satan had an eye problem. And there is a debate as to whether this passage is referring to the king of Babylon or is referring to Satan. However, whether it's Satan or the king of Babylon, we can be clear about it. It's Pride, when used in a sinful way, can be very, very destructive. It can be. Revelations tells us that even, uh, that it tells us, excuse me, Revelations tells us that when Satan, uh, Lucifer, fell from heaven, that he took one third of the angels with him. So the key here in that passage is where we place our focus. Where do we focus our thoughts and our, our mind at? Clearly, it's an issue of the heart. It's a heart matter. It's what we would call matters of the heart. When our focus falls completely on us, okay, falls completely on us, when we promote ourselves constantly, we run the risk of falling into this trap. I hope y'all hear me now. The Bible says it is a sin that every one of us can fall into this trap if we are not careful where we walk. We've got to walk boldly for the Lord. We've got to walk in a straight and narrow path. And listen to what uh, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5. And, and, and what uh, is seen rather than what is in the heart. It is a difference between the people seen on the outside and what is actually going on on the inside. Y'all with me now? I don't know about you, but I'm not really impressed when someone is constantly telling me how wonderful they are. I don't, I'm not really impressed with someone always showing me all their certificates and what all they got 24-7. It's one thing to brag a little bit, but every time that you're on uh, Facebook or your own social media or things are going on, it's always braggadocious about you. We got to watch out for that. I'm kind of turned off by it personally. You see, pride is a very dangerous trap. And like any trap, there are consequences when we fall in it. Isaiah, uh, again in Isaiah, we see in verse 15, pride leads to destruction, which means death, death and destruction. It is possible to become so full of pride and self that we actually die spiritually. We can get so caught up with the things that we're doing that make us look good that we really end up in a spiritual death. So one might ask, well, how does that really happen? How does that happen? It happens when our focus falls completely on ourselves, on ourselves. Jesus knew this, of course. He knew it. 
And when he came to these men who would become his disciples, that is why Jesus said, if anyone is going to come after me, follow me. He, that means put everything else aside and follow me. He must put pride out of the way. He must deny himself and follow, follow him. And clearly Jesus demands, he demanded this because he knew that pride can lead to death. He demands this of us even today, that we must put away all other things and follow him. And the consequences, pride will result in ridicule from other people. When you always show, when you got all this pride, you're going to stand in ridicule. They wonder with all of that pride in his life, what go, what's going on, what's going to really happen to him. You see, as much as we might like to think so, other people really don't want to hear. <laughs> as much as we think that people want to see everything and hear everything constantly about how good we are. The reality is <laughs> that people don't want to hear us talk constantly about how great we are and how much we've accomplished. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see that 24-7. They may act impressed on the outside. Oh, wow, that's really great. That's really good. Oh, my goodness. I mean, that goes the same the thing with preachers. You see preachers that have churches, and they, they got them handed to them by their fathers or their grandfathers or their uncles or aunts, and then they're like, look at what I got. Look what's going on over here. Look at what how I'm doing. I'm doing great, and, and, and it's good that there's growth. There's good that there's people following, but you can't be so self-centered and focused on you, and people will act impressed on the outside and be kind and, and even be kind to you about it, but on the inside, they can't wait until you stop bragging. Just stop bragging. Let's see the change of lives. Let's see people really, people can stand up and say, yeah, I'm a, I want to join this church. I want to be a part of you. But what are they doing for the kingdom of God? What are the, Where's their growth in God where they're actually growing and not just following you because you got a good, you got a good following going on. You got, you got the ability. God has given you a gift to be able to preach the word. But we, we in the church have gotten so caught up with the jumping and the shouting, and if the if the um, music uh, organist or, or, or keyboardist plays a certain tune, then everybody just cuts loose. We get so used to that type of church mentality, playing church and calling it the Spirit, calling it the Holy Ghost. And I'm not saying none of it's, but I mean, see, we get so we get so caught up in it. Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. Because it becomes a part of pride. It becomes a, and if for one Sunday you decide, I mean, you decide or God decide, however it goes, that you're not going to shout that Sunday. People look at you like, well, what's happening? Why that person ain't shouting today? I'm just saying. There's consequences. Pride destroys people right to be proud of many things. But America has placed its pride in the wrong places, in the wrong things. We should always be proud to be an American, but we should be careful of the things that we are proud of and the things we place our trust in. If our trust is not in God, then what's America to be proud of? We put in God we trust on our money, but we keep it all for ourselves. We give very little back to the one who has provided for us over and abundantly. We want to live life to the fullest, so we celebrate life, yet we perform 1.2 million abortions each year in the U.S. While 83% of Americans claim to be Christian, only 35% of Americans believe in the Bible in the Bible 
as being totally accurate. Hmm. What's that tell you? For America, we remain great. We must return in order for America to have to be able to say that they're great. I'll say it like that. We have to return to God. We can no longer just talk the talk. We've got to walk the walk. We've got to step out on faith. And just like we get mixed up with people like David Koresh and Jim Jones and all those different people, Alexander the Great, who conquered an area covering about 3,000 miles, as, as great as many considered him to be, a lot of those men had absolutely horrific tempers where they would murder their closest friends and get away with it. Or they could murder somebody that got in their way. Each one killed hundreds and thousands of people for no reason at all. Yet it was said of them, of him, just like others, that he could conquer many nations. But he couldn't conquer his own self. Because he lifted himself higher. He lifted himself up. That's where we are as a nation today. That's where we are as a nation today. We have power and we have religion and we have wealth. But we really have nothing because we are so full of pride that we believe that we got this and we got it all by ourselves. But without God, Without God, we can do nothing. Without God, it's impossible to please him. But with God, we have the potential to be truly, truly great people. And just so we can regain greatness, we got to put our faith in Christ, the solid rock. We have to pray for our leaders and our government, our country, and right here in our own communities. We have to pray for pray for people. We have to live out that faith through our actions. And we have to always stand for what is right, even when it's an unpopular decision. So today, I give your life I'd like you to give your life to Christ for those of you all that do not know him. Get yourself in a local church body and make your life count for God. Make your life count for God. If you don't stand for Christ, you'll fall for anything. If you don't stand for Christ, you will fall for anything. So, with that being said, I'm going to read a few of my uh, posts from Pranitha. Um, she She's a very dear friend of mine in the gospel. I have not really met, per, met her personally, but we have uh, been on Bible studies together, and she is a good friend, a uh, spiritual uh, friend of mine. Um, and she says, it's such a blessing to be on. I always want to listen. Thank you. And um, so let's see. Yes, it will. It will. So don't let it make you bitter because we serve an awesome God. And God can and will do anything for us but fail. Amen. Um, hallelujah. He who walks with the wise men will be wise. Glory. Um, hallelujah. Amen. I see a lot of amens, praises. The Lord, praise the Lord, my God. Hallelujah. God created the earth that you that we got. Amen. Thank you, God. Yes, that's what she's saying. Um, amen, Pranitha. Thank you very much for joining. You all, I that was the end of this. If you choose, if you don't know the Lord out there, 
and you choose to want to know the Lord, all it's easy. You just ask the Lord to come into your heart, to be ruler and king of your heart. Just right now, just bow your heads and say, Lord, here I am. Here I am, Marla, a sinner. Lord God, please forgive me for anything and everything, my sins that I know of and those that I don't even know or can't remember, Lord. Father God, forgive me, for I have angered you, for I have sinned against you, God. Please forgive me. You are the King of kings, Lord of lords, and I want you to be Lord of my life. I accept you now. Please come into my heart and reign. Be ruler over my heart. Take control over my thoughts and my heart so that I will be able to serve you with fullness. Father God, in the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. That's easy. It's easy to just pray. Please forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart. Take control over my heart, Lord. That's as easy, as easy as knowing to forgive you. Now, I'm going to end today with a song um, by um, Change Me, O Lord, by Pamela Moore. I don't have any right to this music. Make me more like you. Change me, oh God. Wash me through, through. Create a clean. of you.
Thank you. Thank you.